Today's episode of Socially Democratic is presented to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street is a campaign agency that specialises in community organising. We only work with people that want to build power to make the world a better place, including community-based organisations, trade unions, progressive businesses and social democratic parties across the globe. We develop community engagement strategies to win campaigns both big and small. Uh, we train engagement staff and volunteers in the Gantz framework of leadership organising action and we help folks craft their story through the practice of public narrative that connects people through shared values and moves them to act together. And if you want to get members of your community or your constituency to work together, uh, then hit us up at dunstreet.com. Uh, .com.au. Today's episode is also brought to you by Morris Blackburn Lawyers. The Morris Blackburn Corporate Conduct and Class Actions Symposium uh, is back uh, for uh, 2024. It's on May the 2nd this year with tickets selling fast for this year's Legal Industry Showcase event. This year's program includes another all-star lineup, including a keynote uh, from the High Court, the Honourable Justice Robert Beach Jones, uh, to secure your tickets to hear from the nation's industry experts in class actions, corporate conduct, data privacy, and advocates in both consumer and shareholder matters, simply visit morrisblackburn.com.au forward slash class hyphen actions forward slash symposium. I think we might put that link in the bio. Uh, so you can just click on that as opposed to having to type that out from uh, my poor reading of it um, and enter the discount code of VIP for a 50% discount, which is available to listeners of this wonderful podcast or, or feel free to contact the Morris Blackburn events team directly by emailing MBL events at morrisblackburn.com.au and mention this podcast uh, and you'll get a discount. Fantastic. Get on down to that. That's on May the 2nd uh, this year, the Morris Blackburn Corporate Conduct and Class Actions Symposium. Hello and welcome to another episode of Socially Democratic, your weekly centre-left politics and organising podcast that's out every Friday that dives into the progressive campaigns of the day and the people leading them from home and abroad. And we're heading back to the old dart. It's been a while since we've done a podcast on UK politics. Uh, quite a while, in fact. And this year is an election year in um, in Britain, the Westminster House of Commons elections are up. Uh, we don't know when they are. We'll find out about that in the show today. But we're going to be talking to Claire Ainsley, who's been on the show before. Uh, Claire was a former policy director for Labor opposition leader Keir Starmer, and she's now the director or one of the directors at the Progressive Policy Institute, leading up a project uh, on the uh, on the centre left renewal project that she's running. Uh, so Claire will be on the show today, basically to give us an overview of everything that's happening in UK politics right now, how the Tory government is faring, uh, why is, how and why is Labor managed to get themselves back in the front uh, in the polls, which has been the first time since they changed from Jeremy Corbyn to uh, Keir Starmer as leader, and how that has come about, and what does Labor need to do to maintain this lead of the polls and make sure that they win at the next general election. So looking forward to having a chat to Claire about that uh, if you like the show don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on apple podcast spotify or wherever you get your podcast um, and give us five stars while you're doing that and to support the show um, you should uh, jump on uh, social democratic patreon which will be launching in a couple of weeks time where you can access uh, show updates new merchandise and more but we'll be giving you more information on that uh, in the coming episodes uh, but for everything else follow dunn street on youtube Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. All right, let's get to today's episode. We are taping this one on a Tuesday evening on the lands of the Wurundjeri people. And uh, joining me uh, is the director for the Progressive Policy Institute project on Center Left Renewal. She's also an author. Uh, she wrote a book, The New working class and a former policy director for the UK Labor leader, Keir Starmer. And she joins us on the line from uh, Yorkshire in the UK. Claire Ainsley, welcome back to Socially Democratic. Thank you for having me. Now, uh, it's been a while since we spoke. In fact, the last time I think we spoke, you were actually out here in Australia um, doing a bit of a fact-finding uh, mission. Interested to know how that all went when you went home. Um, but before we sort of dive into that kind of stuff, obviously there's an election in the UK this year, 
Um, and it's been a while since we've spoken about UK politics, and I just thought it was an opportune time now to, uh, for our Australian audiences anyway, get a sense of how things are tracking as we head into this election year. First of all, when is this election supposed to happen, the, the Westminster election? So it has to be held by January 2025. Um, it is the prerogative of the incumbent prime minister as to when that election is called. Our prime minister, Rishi Sunak, conservative prime minister, has said expect it in the second half of this year, which is suitably vague and, of course, does not stop speculation running that he will call an earlier election he has one problem, which is that every poll shows that he's going to lose pretty badly. So he has the unenviable task, really, of deciding when to call it. If he calls it sooner, um, as I say, all polls are showing that the Conservatives are heading for a defeat. They've been in power for 14 years, so and they hold an 80-seat majority, which is a big majority in British terms. But If he holds it later, things aren't getting any better. So if anything, the polls are possibly even widening rather than narrowing, but they're certainly holding firm. So he has a, uh, yeah, he has a task to decide when it is. Obviously, it's really tricky for the Labour opposition because they have to remain in campaign mode and be ready to go because theoretically you could, at the shortest, be about six weeks out from an election. Um, But of course, but, you know, of course, there's some process around that. But um, but that's where we are. So we certainly think there'll be one this year. Most bets are probably on uh, an autumn, October, um, October or November election. So, I mean, I was looking at the polls yesterday uh, when we were doing some research for this episode. And, yeah, to your point, I mean, the Labor's been streets ahead now since basically December 2022. And I kind of want to get to the heart of why that has been the case but before we do that can you just sort of set the scene for us as we enter into as we entered into this year of 2024 um what is the feeling what's the vibe uh amongst the british population about politics about the country where it's heading um and and maybe then sort of dive into some of the more specific issues that are confronting folks um in the uk i know i was in scotland visiting family uh, in uh, the middle of last year and things just talking to folks, it was gloomy. Like I'd never really, like everyone was saying, and I, and I won't use all the language that they were saying because a lot of these conversations were in the pub, but they were basically saying the country's, you know, not yeah. in a great shape. Um, yeah. And I just want to get a sense of how is it now and sort of what are we sort of mid-April 2024? Yeah, the the vibe is, oh. Like it's it's not um, engaged in politics particularly. Most people are not thinking about when there's going to be an election. Mo- uh, lots of people just feel very let down by by politics in general. I mean, obviously, some of that manifests in anti-conservative feeling, but there is a real uh, sense that people don't think that anybody's really got the answers to the country's challenges. A big frustration that they feel that, like, just ordinary people have had everything piled onto them from the pandemic to uh, the fact that we weren't we weren't well prepared, not just for the pandemic, but we had a big program of public spending cuts in advance. So that has put our health service in a poor shape to deal with, you know, a huge pandemic that has still having repercussions. Our economy is, is again, not in great shape. We've had low growth um, and been kind of borderline recession at different points. And, of course, people's costs have been rising and energy costs were where the focus of that was. But most of us have seen almost all costs seem to go up way more than wages. And we did have stagnant wages for quite a long period. They, they started to shift a bit upwards last year. But, of course, that wasn't compensating for what people were missing out in terms of what was going out of their household finances. So there is a kind of a real frustration, I think, that politics has been so inward looking and has been so uh, concerned and preoccupied with kind of Westminster antics. And um, the Conservatives have proved themselves to be a poor, uh, a poor leadership at a time when we've needed something different. There's a curiosity about Labour. So I think people are open to what Labour have to say. 
But those who are engaged are either people who are enthusiasts, but a lot of people are just feeling like they're not sure how Labour might be different to the Conservatives, apart from clearly Keir Starmer is a more competent politician than the Conservatives. Labour seem relatively united, so that is helping them along. But there isn't really a kind of sense, a clear sense of what Labour uh, stand for amongst the population. And I think there's really good reasons why, which we can talk about what Labour's strategy has been. But um, you you were you had a good focus group in the pub because that is that is typical of how quite a lot of the country is feeling. Um, we we can change, but at the moment it's um it's not the brightest outlook for us. There was also a sense among some um more switched on uh, punters that even though the polls were looking good for Labor and bad for the Conservatives and to the point, and I actually want to ask you in a moment about why, what has the Conservatives done that has kind of stuffed it up so much and what, what antics in Westminster, but there was a kind of a view of uh, that Sunak, the Prime Minister, you can't write him off. Now, this was June, July last year, and so lots has happened since then, but they were saying that we are still nervous about um, him and his ability to connect with voters and to be able to turn this sinking ship around. Is that still the case? You've had a good chance to have a look at him now as Prime Minister? Yeah, probably a little bit less so because we're now probably like, you know, nine months, 10 months on from that and the polls don't seem to be budging in his direction. Um, the Conservatives were really harmed, you know, of their own making from the short tenure of Liz Truss as Prime Minister. So she came in after Boris Johnson, who was he was divisive, but he was popular with a big part of the population. But, you know, he tripped himself up by uh, breaking the rules during the lockdown, and that went down exceptionally badly with the population. And, and I think particularly in terms of what went wrong for the Conservatives, I think that before he got quite a lot of kudos around the vaccine and the pandemic, but his failure to stick to the rules and not provide that kind of clear leadership, I think was seen as a real problem. And then the party gate fiasco, which was not just breaking the rules. It was a kind of a sense that the kind of conservatives in number 10 Downing street were having a fine time of it whilst, and Australia was in the same position people were really, really struggling. People were really struggling. And obviously there was a, you know, a high death toll and uh, the country suffered during that time. There was also, it emerged that on the eve of Prince Philip's funeral, um, there was a party in, in Downing Street and whether people are Republicans or, or monarchists, there is such a respect for our late queen that the thought, the sight, the photo of her grieving alone during the funeral and us knowing that the night before the kind of political uh, advisors team under Johnson had been kind of having this party in Downing Street unrelated but just just really offended people's sense of right and wrong and then of course we've had the cost of living crisis since then Liz Truss then made things much worse during her short tenure because she then introduced a budget um, that sent the markets uh, wild and caused a huge hike in mortgage um, in mortgage rates. So there were the things that people understood were not in our national government's control, like energy prices or the Ukraine war or even the pandemic. But on top of that, the Conservatives have been like the worst possible government you could have during that time. Sunak hasn't was then elected. Well, he wasn't elected actually. It was a kind of a coup to get him in from his peers in Parliament. He's he's seen as a competent leader, but he's not seen as a strong leader. His party are very divided, and since last summer, there hasn't really been much movement in the polls. So I think what Sunak hoped for was that the economy would start to improve, and he and his chancellor Jeremy Hunt could do a better the devil you know, we've got a plan, we're going to bring the deficit down. Yes, that means a bit of pain with public services, but we are going to get the country's economy back onto the straight and narrow and don't risk it with Labour, who've still got, you know, uh, a left-wing MPs and 
could bring in a detrimental program to the economy. It hasn't really panned out like that for him. So the economy is not in great shape yet. And people aren't feeling any benefit from wage rises, particularly because of all the other factors. But also, even if they do, it's not certain that they will credit the Conservatives with that. So I definitely think do not write the Conservatives off. They are the most effective election winning machine, you know, that we have that we know. But it doesn't feel like the public is coming around uh, in their direction. So at the moment, it looks more likely than not that Labour would be in power. But um, we're really mindful of the fact that it may not pan out that way. And therefore, no one's putting any money on it. You've actually just, that was a great summary there. And I have so many now questions that I want to ask you of those ones. <laughs> One of them I do want to ask you about actually is really kind of a bit of a sidebar, but just when you mentioned Liz Trust, did you catch her when she went over to the US to the conservative conference? C, was it called C? Is it, C? The, it's not called C. Is it the NatCons? Yeah, I don't want to say it's CPAC, but it can't be. Is it CPAC? Yeah. Is it CPAC? Uh, no, that's a TV, that's the TV network, isn't it? No. I've got a mental block. What's that pro, What's that whole crazy right-wing uh, conference that goes for like four days? And she spoke at it to, to a room that had like, there was like 15 people there. And then at the end, when she finished, she sort of had to lonely walk off the stage. And it just, I don't know if it, that, that was did the rounds in the UK, but I thought that was eminently funny. It was just, it looked so shit. She just looked lonely and hopeless yeah like it's it was quite big news here actually i mean it wasn't big news in the u.s because as you say like nobody was paying attention but liz truss has been on this mission to kind of rehabilitate uh right-wing conservatism so sort of orthodox uh economic conservatism because the fact that she failed so badly and she basically introduced a kind of orthodox uh, economic conservatism quite abruptly into Britain. And, and frankly, any big policy changes like that are going to cause um, big reactions if you don't kind of moderate them and so on. So she's on this mission to convince everybody that it wasn't her that screwed the economy or her Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng. It was actually, she's she sort of called it these, um, you know, these forces that are in control of the economy. So she's blamed the Financial Times. She's blamed the BBC. I mean, everybody seems to be the problem rather than her. And she's also got a book to sell. So she's kind of regurgitating all of this, uh, you know, policies that she wanted to implement in terms of, you know, rapid tax cuts, benefiting the wealthy. And so she really discredited not only herself, but she discredited a whole school of thought that has spent the last 30 years trying to get back into power. So the only that's the only silver lining that I can take from her disastrous prime ministership is that she not only did for herself, she did for a school of thought, which I think is fundamentally wrong. So she's kind of back on the scene trying to um, promote these ideas. Right. But really is um, thought of so badly by the British population because of the direct impact that her policies had negatively on them. But I can't see how uh, Number 10 and the Conservative Party headquarters aren't tearing their hair out, going, Liz, just leave it alone. Slog the book after an election. This is not helping us. Um, but, yeah, she won't have it. Well, that goes to my next question. But my final thought was that you could actually see people in the front row standing around. They sort of stood up and looked around. I think you could almost hear them saying, I don't know who that was. (laughs) As she sort of (laughs) walked off the stage, a former, you know, former prime minister of a G7 nation. And uh, they were baffled to who this person was. It was quite funny. Anyway, so one of the tasks for Sunak is then he has to, well, does he have to disown himself from the sins of the past like how is he trying to say that okay i'm a conservative but i'm not that crazy um and uh i've got a new vision for what how and where britain needs to go is he doing that or is he trying to own some of it because i mean he's been a part of this government right so he can't just disown it completely it's a really interesting question when johnson came to power he presented himself in 2019 bear in mind that he was now the 
uh, that was like the fourth election win for the Conservatives. He almost presented as a new Conservative Party, a new different type of politics that was fusing slightly more centrist even to the left economics, uh, more intervention with a sort of more, he, he himself was actually quite socially liberal. Sunak just hasn't had the ability to distance himself from the past. He's had opportunities to do that and has not done so, either on the kind of party gate um, moral uh, standards and ethics, where I think he could have drawn a clearer line and perhaps um, have got some credit for that, but it would have been hard with his party. Or really on the economics, he's, 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 he's changed and flip, flopped around. And then on some of the kind of social and cultural issues, he's kind of lent into some of the culture wars um, stuff, but it doesn't quite sit right with him in some ways. So he hasn't been able to distance himself from his predecessors. I think it's either because he himself is not a strong enough conviction politician who doesn't know where he wants to go on those things, or he just can't do because his party are quite powerful now and um, he is not. Contrast that with Keir Starmer, who has taken every opportunity to distance himself from the, his past Labour Party in terms of Jeremy Corbyn, uh, the previous Labour leader who was obviously far to the left. And uh, Cor- Corbyn and Starmer, there is a clearer contrast, whereas with Sunak, it's a much uh, murkier picture because you're not really sure where to place him. Uh, that's a great time to then talk about the good guys. Um, let's talk about Kia, Sir Kia, uh, Starmer. Um, obviously, strong in the polls, has been for a long, long time. And I think I think for the moment he took over, um, I don't think that when Jeremy Corbyn was leader of the Labour Party, he, he never, ever led in the polls. And then from the moment that Keir Starmer took over, not straight away, but obviously had to build a lead, but got there and has held it. What are the foundations that he's that he, he and his team and Labor have done or planted to get themselves in this position in the first place? What, what, how, the, how have they built this lead in the polls? And I know there are only polls, but how have they got mm. to this position? Yeah, so when um, so when Keir Starmer became leader of the Labour Party, it was April 2020. Labour were 26 points behind the Conservatives. So, you know, in our terms, a very, very big uh, margin of difference. Starmer, actually, we managed to pull, and I joined the team at that point, we pulled level by about in the autumn. We were level with the Tories. But the... Why we were pulling level was almost there was this relief in the country that there was an alternative and people who had been put off by Corbyn uh, who were more, well, we didn't know at the time, but we then dug down into the data in terms of who, where that support was coming from and where we were getting that additional support initially was we were building up support in the urban areas amongst the more kind of liberal constituency which is a really important part of the British electoral map we were not making the headway in the places that we had set out to make headway in which was you know why I joined the team with my uh, my sort of background and interest on working class voters we were not making headway in working class places uh, and with working class people they were still, we were still where we were and therefore the elections that we then had the first set of elections we had which would be like our local elections. Uh, And we had a big by-election in Hartlepool, which is a um, working class, generally a working class area uh, in my my part of the country. We lost that by-election, even though we had quite, quite, you know, a good new leader who was making a good impression with voters. But, you know, we were still in the pandemic and that kind of walk politics in some ways. But the bigger reason that was underneath it was that working class voters, and I mean that, in our context, in the broadest sense of the term. So we're not talking about narrowly targeting traditional working class voters who who are quite a small part of the population. Working class voters in their very much more modern form, multi-ethnic, probably more likely to be female than male, just people who are on low to middle income type jobs, probably in like towns and suburbs, maybe as well as in the kind of big urban centres, 
So we weren't making the headway that we needed to. And that has been a program. It's been a program that Starm has had from the very beginning, but it's taken a long time. It's taken really the fall of Boris Johnson and Labour to lay the foundations of saying to those voters, we were not representing you. We haven't been representing you for a long time. We are here. We are back as the party of working people. So we're going to have a program on strengthening your rights at work, your position at work, bringing you good jobs, increasing your wages, but also a program which is saying you are going to be secure with us. So your defence is secure because Corbyn was absolutely thought not to be strong on national security and a program of uh, progress on equality, but moderated so that it goes with the flow of the way people feel rather than as Corbyn did, as we've seen in some parts, Democratic Party, some of the types of progressive politics, which perhaps can be uh, not taking as many people uh, with them on uh, pro-equality causes. So he's had a programme, but it's just taken longer to come off. And then the the story of Conservatives is one, as I've described, that has then complemented that when those voters have then been ready to pull away from the Conservatives, they've started to then come over to Labour, but a lot of them are coming over to, we don't know how we're going to vote, or to Reform UK, which is a very small party uh, in traditional terms, but is actually capturing quite a lot of attention and support amongst working class voters in particular. That's really interesting that you said at the, that your remarks at the start, where you said that the initial swing towards Labour in uh, was in that sort of small L liberal urban areas where I just would have, you might need to clarify who, what type of voter that looks like. Cause I would have assumed they would have been voting for Corbyn anyway. Yeah. So, uh, so, I mean, like Corbyn did badly in the 2019 election. So I um, would be saying, uh, places like, um, so maybe, maybe less so central London would be typical, but like the, uh, what we might describe as Cambridgeshire, Peterborough, places that would be probably been a bit, bit put off by Corbyn, but were, were maybe, I wouldn't say like affluent as in rich, but they're not the kind of economically insecure part of the population. That's the bit that's really moved in the period from sort of 2021 to 23. That bit is the bit that's come away from the Conservatives and that bit is the, that is the, place to play in really because that is where I think the kind of uh, centre of gravity for British politics is is these more economically insecure voters but those first sort of types of liberal voters would be maybe more there's quite a lot of like quite big cities outside of London but they were not necessarily infused by Corbyn by 2019 in 2017 lots of them were voting uh, for Labour but that had really come away by 2019. Just so I can kind of ground myself here, and maybe this might be helpful for our listeners as well. I don't know why, I'm, uh, and I don't mean to bang on about this. So, would it have been fair to say that the the coalition of voters that were the rump, or not the rump, but the the the, the ingredient to the success of the Blair governments, would have been its traditional working class heartland in all of the major cities and towns of the UK, but also then picking up the what I'd call the kind of the home counties middle class electorates that had historically voted for Thatcher that was kind of the new bit that they kind of brought in can you is, one is that right and two then tell me what did those voting groups do uh when, when labor weren't successful so when when they when they through that 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 uh that Corbyn leadership and what have they done to bring that group back those, those yeah, groups so- back. Where, where, where are those groups now yeah, in broad terms, that is that is correct, that Labour has won on the whole when it has brought together an electoral coalition, and this is obviously hugely simplifying the population, but for the sort of purposes of explanation, it's brought together working class voters, traditional and new, because obviously the working class was changing a lot during the Blair era as well, and the more, I would say, more sort of socially liberal-minded somewhat more middle class voters and that's the origin the Labour Party is actually found in documents put together that electoral coalition so it's a coalition of the trade unions which were obviously much more uh, representative then of the working class population and some of the more kind of uh, intellectual strands of uh, centre-left thinking the Fabians and others so that's all rooted in Labour's kind of rule book and foundation 
And that broadly is the coalition that when Labour can unite that coalition, it can win. And it changes over time, but that is essentially what Starmer's trying to do now and what Blair did successfully in 1997. But there were a lot of people started to pull away, a lot of working class voters started to pull away from Labour really from 2001 onwards, you see that pull away. So that kind of Middle England vote, which isn't necessarily very middle class, but that Middle England vote of people who are a bit more mainstream minded, could vote for either party, probably haven't voted Labour since 2005. That's who Starmer has been going for. And there's been lots of media discussion that he's going for what we call this red wall voter, which was this geographically specific areas that had always voted Labour. Like, if Labour wins those at the next election, they will emotionally feel and symbolically feel very important. But there is not enough of them to win a majority in the House of Commons. You have to win over kind of Middle England, Middle Britain, that kind of mainstream voter. And there's many more of them in Scotland than sometimes the SNP would like to make out. Um, And also people have become much more economically insecure in that period. So therefore, they you need to have parties which are genuinely going to have answers to problems of economic insecurity in a way that I think the Conservatives struggle with, because they ultimately are economic liberals. So that's what Starmer has been going for is that kind of appeal. So you you have a difficult balancing act, because similar to Australia, you're still you're still trying to pull in people who perhaps a younger vote who might be more inclined if we had a bigger Green Party, people who are quite concerned about the about climate and the environment. You're trying to kind of hug them in as well as really speak cogently for the mainstream of people who are struggling a bit now financially and putting that holiday on hold that they might have done a few years ago and don't really feel that they're being represented by politics overall very well. You've got to hold those voters in your mind always. Um, and we weren't getting those voters in the first the first phase of Starmer's leadership, but he was always focused. He didn't change towards them. He was always focused on them. But it took a while before those voters would pull away from the Conservatives. And when they did, it's now a battle on to see who they will vote for next time. Okay, I really appreciate that clarity there. That's great. So what has what have you seen that Starmer and Labor have done to seek to reach out to those folks and address their concerns about this sort of economic insecurity that they're experiencing? So the cost of living crisis has been I think the the kind of a theater if you like for how focus came away from the pandemic and onto people's household finances and we obviously had a big kind of furlough scheme during the pandemic and obviously that support was time limited but what then happened was um, the pullback on uh, where the economy was at and the lack of that we had a lack of investment in our infrastructure for some time we've obviously had Brexit in the middle of this which has really been quite a disruptive factor in our economic performance, leaving aside whether people think it was the right or wrong thing to do. It's obviously had a big effect in terms of our exports, in terms of renegotiating deals and on the competitiveness of our our trade. So all told, like it has been a pretty difficult period for the British economy. And then Labour have, uh, were much clearer during the cost of living crisis in how they would uh, make the energy giants cough up and the Tories were resistant to any call for a windfall tax. So Labour, I I think, had about a five-month run when it was calling for a windfall tax. Very clearly, they basically spoke to people, went out and called for one thing, a windfall tax so that you could have a discount on your bills. And that, I think, cut through and then eventually the Conservative government did it and I think in policy terms, like it's not the most left wing thing people could do. It's not, it, you know, it's been done before. But I think what it did was it really crystallised that there was a political difference between the Conservatives and Labour. And in the end, the Conservatives have had to, have had to uh, 
uh, steal quite a lot of Labour's economic policies in order to try and shore the economy up. So that's the thing that I think has started to cut through. But obviously, that again is a time limited policy. So what Labour are, are having to do now is how would they compete against the Conservatives on the economy beyond being a better steward um, of the economy? And at the moment, I think they are still wanting and they still need uh, economic policies that are going to speak to people directly because they've they've messaged very clearly on reassurance that you clearly can't spend your way out of every problem. We are not in the shape to do that. But they will need to be able to say to voters on the door when they are in a campaign mode, this is the economic difference, difference that we are going to make to you. And that is the bit that I think hasn't necessarily cut through to voters yet, even though I think they've got some quite interesting and imaginative policies about what they would do around infrastructure. They haven't necessarily got the retail ones yet, but we're not in the campaign yet. Is it the, um, the, you you spoke before about the hesitancy that some voters may have. They've switched off from the Conservative Party. They've probably stopped listening to them. So that's obviously um, a challenge for them to try and overcome. And that that sometimes is probably poison. You can't deal with that once they stop listening, but they haven't completely jumped across to labor. Is this a trust thing or is this a, like, I mean, is there an, like, is there a, is, was there some damage from the Corbyn era that is still in the minds of voters that, uh, or is it like I'm kind of like a plague on both your houses? This this sort of feeling towards politicians that they're all full of shit. Like w- what does labor need to do to lock in that group of voters that you're talking about? Yeah, it's a it's a combination of all of those factors. So uh, PPI did a big piece of research on working class voters in the UK last autumn, and although they were clearly there was most saying you know they're not going to vote Conservative, um, certainly not again. The kind of the vote was split, and um, as I say, like in that poll, more were going to reform than they were going to Labour. Um, and, and they were winning over a chunk who were, you know, attracted by uh, a different message. And frankly, we have a two-party system in our country. So therefore, voting for a form or an alternative is, is unlikely to see that represented in Parliament. But I think it was a sense that none of the parties were delivering for them. Um, I think that it's quite a lot for people who voted Conservative perhaps for the first time in 2019 to regret that vote and then go straight to Labour. So I think some of it is a bit inevitable. I think that they often feel like no one's really speaking for them. Immigration has been, continues to be a kind of top tier issue. And they don't feel that the Conservatives have sorted immigration, as they would see it. We have a lot of visible boat crossings across the Channel, um, English Channel on the South Coast, and they don't have faith that Labour will sort those things either. So it might be that some of those voters are are not reachable by Labour, um, but they're technically going to them with an economic message um, to see whether they can pull more people over, because there's a hell of a lot of people still saying, I don't know how I'm going to vote, and that mm-hmm. is what Sunak's banking on. Who's the Reform Party? Who are these guys? So Reform Party, so we kind of, on the margins often well we've had it's the kind of the successor to the uk independence party so the uk independence party was a party that was basically all about uh leaving the european union we have now left the european union and uh they found their sort of successor in something called reform it's actually i think set up as a company not a party nigel farage is a well-known figure in these um parts uh associated with uh reform And they've basically set out a program which I think is not really what a lot of working class voters particularly want. It's quite economically right wing, which is not where those voters are, but it is putting immigration to the fore. And that's the the big, uh, the big issue that they'll campaign on. Um, So they'll probably stand in uh, a lot of constituencies. They'll on the whole rival the conservatives for votes. Um, So, Broadly speaking, it can sometimes benefit Labour, but they are a negative force in 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 British politics because they pull the debate over to the right. So even if electorally it would mean a little bit better for Labour, I don't welcome their uh, profile because of the knock-on effect it has on 
debates about immigration, which we need to have a better, a more sensible, a more reasoned debate about. I mean, where would they stand? Like, what parts of the country would you find a reform candidate putting their hand up to try and uh, try and jag a constituency? So they've said they're going to stand everywhere, but they 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 possibly could get a member of parliament. There's talk of them standing in somewhere called Clacton on Sea, which is an area which has uh, previously had an MP switch from the Conservatives to UKIP. So kind of that's the sort of southeast eastern regions where there's quite a lot of kind of feeling like they have been uh not had any attention paid to them left behind somewhat that um the immigration there that is is an issue or it, not necessarily immigration in the constituency but feelings about immigration run a bit higher um and culturally probably quite conservative so those are the sorts of areas where they could maybe cause an upset upset if Nigel Farage stood. But he will be weighing up what his biggest impact has been because Nigel Farage has never been a member of parliament, but he is one of the most influential figures in British politics of the last 10 years. Um, so he might calculate that he can cause more mischief and mayhem by continuing to wind up the Conservatives from the sidelines. He's even talked about joining the Conservatives at some point, which would um, be an interesting development. <laughs> Um, there has been a number of by-elections uh, since we certainly last spoken on the show, uh, and I was in Glasgow at the time of the Rutherglen um, by-election in which Labor took the seat off of the SNP, a huge, huge result for Labor there. Yeah. Um, just maybe want to get your reflections on what Labor is learning from their successes at by-elections. Uh, yeah, let me ask that question first, and then I want to do a follow-up of that, actually, where Labor's going to focus geographically in terms of trying to get to the, the, the seats they needed to win in the House of Commons. But talk to me about what they're learning from these by-election successes. So Labor's had a series of by-elections, as you say, where they've had really quite stunning victories. Uh, so in constituencies that would be seen as symbolic for Labor, so um, Rutherglen was one but there was a specific set of circumstances around the uh, MP, which made you think, you know, she was unlikely. The SNP MP had broken the, the COVID rules. The, the other successes are really interesting. So Selby, which is in my neck of the woods, is a um, quite a rural seat. Um, re- big, big conservative majority. And, I thought, look, I'm going to go campaigning. It's in my locality and, you know, it's, it's quite enjoyable going to those sorts of campaigns. But you don't really seriously think Labour's going to overturn, um, I think it might have been a 14,000, maybe even more majority. But, but Labour did and Labour won that seat and they won in, um, the, I think Lib Dems won in Somerton as well. So the anti-conservative feeling is coming up in all of the by-elections but what is also interesting is that Labour didn't actually win that many more votes in some of those by-elections, but Conservatives are really staying at home. And I spoke to lots and lots of Conservatives who just said, I can't bring myself to vote for Labour, but I'm not voting for this lot. I'm not mm-hmm. voting for the Conservatives this time. So Conservatives will be taking some kind of heart from that, that there's not direct switching in the same way. So Labour will be learning that Essentially, nothing is in the bag. This is not a big groundswell of support yet for Labour. It is a disenchantment with the current Conservatives, but they need to get enough people over to them to be able to vote Labour. Um, And then I think you could see, even though you have this slightly, as I described it, a kind of uh, feeling about politics at the moment, I think it could translate into potentially quite a big victory for Labour um, because geographically, where the vote is dispersed is quite interesting. What are the criticisms of Keir Starmer's leadership? I'm picking up stuff on social media that he's, um, I guess in Australia, would call it a small target strategy, that he's, he's essentially just trying to get over the finish line because the Conservatives are so bad. Um, I mean, one, is that a fair uh, analysis of his leadership and the way he's been campaigning? Um, and uh, and two, well, you know, maybe that will work because ultimately, what we want to do is just get into government, right? Yeah, I mean, it depends what you care about. Like, so there are people who want to see a kind of bigger, more left wing program from a Labour Party, and they were used to that under Corbyn. 
There are people who want to see lots and lots of spending commitments made because, you know, frankly, the country needs spending in particular areas. So they're not unreasonable, a lot of them. But there is also those people who care about actually getting into government so you can do some of that stuff. And uh, being a good steward of the economy also means not making a bunch of spending commitments that you can't possibly stick to and keep reducing the deficit and keep all people's taxes reasonable and keep money pumping into the public services where you really need it. So I I do see the criticisms of Labour. I don't have a huge amount of time for them because I think that what we're about is we are clause one. We are about electing a political Labour, like representing working people in Parliament. And we haven't done that effectively for a long time. So I think what Starmer and Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor, are doing is is levelling with the public, actually, about the state of the public finances and not pretending that we can kind of get into government and enact a uh, huge spending programme overnight. Um, I also don't think he thinks that that's the answer to everything. I think if you look at our health service, I would like there to be more spending on the health service. I don't think that is the primary problem with it. Um, so, I, so I think that or I don't think it's the only problem with it. And therefore, I think the reform agenda is really, really important to them too. So I don't think it's just, as the critics say, that Sarma and Reeves are taking a kind of more moderate position because that's the way to win. It's also because a more moderate position is the way that they will govern as well because it's the right thing to do. That is going to disappoint some people who want to see a much more socialist programme. But, you know, we tried that. That didn't work. It's time for a unifying strategy and i'm i'm also optimistic that i think starmer and reeves understand some of the fundamentals that need to change as well what does that reform program look like touch wood that labor is successful the next general election i mean it's so i sort of think about britain now and all of the things that it's gone through over the last decade it's you know, Scotland want to leave the union. Um, there's the question of Northern Ireland. Brexit has created all of these complexities. Um, the, all these promises of like, you know, Singapore on the Thames just hasn't eventuated. Um, and if you take over at Downing Street on day one, I, I would be like, what the fuck am I going <laughs> What? Yeah. Am, where do I start? Like if this has been 14 years of just shit public policy and a country yeah. that just doesn't, it just doesn't feel good about itself, you know? Yeah. I mean, Starmer is the man for it. He wants it. Like, he doesn't want to be leader of the opposition. He wants to be prime minister. And I think uh, he will be someone who has got such immense capability of rising to all of the challenges that you've just outlined. Like, they are potentially could be overwhelming. But I think that he's put and the Labour team have put a lot of thought learning from colleagues in Australia, in the US, in Germany, uh, you know, Spain, Portugal, other places where there are centre-left, you know, governments recently, how you set out a positive programme and enact a positive programme in the face of some of the crises that we are now facing at at the pace that, that they are coming. So I think part of what he will want to do is I think he will be well placed to have a better relationship with the European Union and European leaders at a time when we need allies and friends. I mean, we are in a we are in an insecure world, uh, not just economically, but obviously the kind of escalating situation in the Middle East. So, being able to be a a friend, a partner to this important alliance that we've had for such a long time with France, with Germany and others, I think just will, that will be the start of being able to help fuse a a, a kind of a stronger, a a stronger world and a stronger sort of position for for Britain within that, which we've done such damage to ourselves through the way the sort of Conservatives have carried on and, and Brexit and some of the statements that have been made. I think on the economy, which is fundamental, I think they will want to instigate some fairly big changes. So I think what they want is to have uh, an infrastructure program so they've got a green prosperity plan which is about how the state partners with the private sector to get the kind of investment we need to transition the economy there's just been no real strategy around that 
Mm. Um, from the Conservatives, they've kind of changed their minds on it. So a long-term plan for how we create more clean energy and have a stronger position for British, uh, for what Britain can do well. Um, and then on the health service and public services, which is the other big area, they're putting a lot of uh, output at the moment on how the health service would be modernised with labour. Part of that is about workforce and about workforce skills and organisation. Some of it's about technology and some of it will be about funding. So I think that underneath it, Starmer and Reeves have had the opportunity to really think quite deeply about what needs to be done. They are just not going to meet every single stakeholder or interest groups want. And I'm sure the left will say what the left will say right the way through uh, um, the next Labour government. But I think they want to put some fairly big fundamental reforms in um, to to hardwire the economy in a way that creates more security for people. I mean, this podcast is a um, absolute true believer when it comes to uh, investing in, in infrastructure and job creation. Um, and and you know, I've had um, uh, people like you know former Premier Daniel Andrews, who's won you know won three successive elections on the promise that he will and his government will create um, a, a, an infrastructure program, build lots of things that citizens need and ensure that they're Victorian jobs. Um, but you've you got to pay for that as well, right? And at the time when the government did that, borrowing money was cheap. Um, and they did things like leasing the port and whatnot that paid for get, get, getting rid of all these level crossings and, 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 and the like and digging massive tunnels through the city for underground networks of trains and what, what, what have you. But I get a sense that there isn't a lot of cash flying around in the UK right now. How do you pay for all of, if, if you are wanting to invest in infrastructure and modernise Britain and so folks can get around um, this tiny island, how do you pay for that? Like, where are you going to get the money from? Is it from is it investment from pr- the private sector? Is it from foreign investment? Are you going to look to the EU? How do you how do you overcome that challenge? So, Labor um, will create a national wealth fund, which is their means of maximizing private sector investment into uh, infrastructure projects. They would say they want to see you know three pounds of private investment for every one pound of state investment that still leaves you with needing to come up with a lot of state investment and they actually recently took the decision to downgrade their previous commitment which was going to be funded through borrowing which was a commitment that was made um before interest rates our borrowing rates have hugely increased when interest rates were very low actually the state borrowing to invest when interest rates are low is quite, you know, sensible economics. When interest rates have gone up, that obviously puts the deficit in a difficult, um, in much different position. So they've downgraded how much they think they would put in from the state side. And, and they've taken a bit of a hit for that, but I think it was the right decision to make. So they are talking about a kind of a different relationship with business where we improve our standing on foreign and direct investment where we uh, are a state that is investing in the things that we need, but it's not going to be anything like the scale of what activists might want or really what the challenge of getting to a clean clean energy economy really requires. But I think it is a kind of pragmatic response to saying, this is the North Star, we are getting to a clean energy economy, but we're going to have to moderate the pace and the scale that we go at it so I think it's quite a good, um, I think it's quite a good compromise um, rather than saying to consumers or taxpayers, well, we are just getting to green and no matter what, we're going hell for leather. And if that puts your prices up, then so be it. I mean, that is just daft politics and economics. So I think they've got their goal, but they're just moderating how they're going to get there. Um, but it's not easy. It's not easy. Um, and uh, with, an, with a background of underinvestment, I think the the crunch will come quite quickly for a Labour government if they do get into power as to the choices they make about where they invest because it is needed in lots of parts of Britain. And what Rachel Reeves will do will prioritise what is going to create better growth uh, and that is sometimes not where people want the investment. You mentioned before about the conflict in the Middle East. I just want to get a sense from you about how that's impacting domestic politics right now. Obviously, you know, if... Like I was doing some research before the show, and I was just trying to look at some of the issues that are on, you know, the you know the front pages of the, of the Times and the Independent and whatnot. It's just it's all the Middle East right now, and what Sunak's saying, and there's a little bit of Keir Starmer. Like, 
one, there's a large Muslim population in the UK, and I imagine that would be a part of the Labor voting base. Is that causing a problem for Keir Starmer? Um, let's go with that first, and I'll get a follow-up question about just generally how it's sort of impl- impacting on domestic politics broadly. So what's happening in the Middle East is a big interest in the uk so as you said it's like it's leading the news most days at the moment and really since the 7th of october it's been kind of one of the top news items so the uk population is like connected to it quite directly um and uh it's it's definitely like it is a it is is of concern to people and it's a topic of conversation so it's not just a kind of a westminster issue it's something Mm -hmm. that really matters in particular communities particularly uh jewish communities and uh, muslim communities who will be directly uh uh, directly impacted we actually had um a couple of our politicians so the scottish first minister Hamza youssef uh and a liberal democrat politician leila moran whose relatives were trapped in gaza at different points as well so it's a very it very is a very close issue um for um for britain in terms of how it's affected domestic politics, uh, Starmer, like every other kind of you know liberal leader, um, you know leader of his party rather than country, backed Israel's right to defend itself uh, after the seventh of October attacks. But also, like many of those leaders, has become increasingly concerned by the conduct of that war um, by Israel, and that has intensified pressure on him and on the Conservative government to distance themselves from what is now happening in Gaza. And then for the internal politics for Labour, Labour have previously, certainly under Jeremy Corbyn, were very aligned to the Palestinian cause. But actually, and there's there's elements of, a, of, of sympathy right across the British population with the Palestinian cause. So it's not owned by a sort of left grouping there is generally quite a lot of sympathy for for the for the palestinians pre 7th of october for for their right to to a homeland alongside israel so for starmer it has caused quite a big problem because uh the snp went out and called for a ceasefire before labor did which was more in tune with what a lot of kind of activists and some mps wanted there was then a very difficult vote in Parliament where Labour wanted to avoid having to push its MPs to vote against the SNP's amendment, which would have been for ceasefire, but basically because Labour MPs would have come under such intense personal, uh, not just lobbying, but there have been uh, kind of protests, borderline attacks. Uh, it's very, very heated as an issue. So it has been very difficult, I think, to navigate. I think there has been, unfortunately, uh, Starmer early on in the conflict appeared to suggest that Israel had it was okay to cut off some of the humanitarian aid. They then kind of cleared that up, but it really didn't help this sense that Labour were backing the Israel Israel's government in um, defiance of uh, some of what people wanted to see happen in the long term in Palestine. So yeah, it really, we really have been caught up in this in, in in the politics of it. Most of much of that won't have got through to voters, but certainly amongst the Muslim community, we have traditionally been quite supportive of the Labour Party. There is uh, you know some some real concerns about Labour's position on um, on on Gaza. Uh, I think they've probably got into a place where they're trying to align as closely as possible with uh, the current British government, the US government and leaders in Europe so that we are not divided generally because, let's face it, the Israeli government and the Palestinians are not looking at what Britain's doing particularly, mm. but um, but trying to sort of maintain a united front. But obviously that's come with all the difficulties um, that a conflict of this, this nature entails. Um, we uh, I sh- we should wrap up because I need to let you go and embrace your uh, your Tuesday morning. But uh, one thing we haven't talked about, we kind of skirted around it, and I always tend to come to this kind of conversation, mostly because of my background, um, but the role that Scotland will play in this next election. Um, and I know that I want to remind our listeners that when Tony, Tony Blair won uh, in 97 and then the election after, he didn't actually need the seats in Scotland. They won enough seats in, the, in, in England and Wales to get... Uh, a majority in the House of Commons, but I feel like this time around, Scotland is going to play an important role for Labor. 
Um, you made that point before about the SNP coming out and taking a strong position on uh, on a ceasefire in the Middle East. Um, how is Labor looking in terms of winning back support in a place that once was their absolute heartland? It's going to be really important. So Starmer from the get-go prioritised Scotland as part of his electoral strategy, which looked a beyond optimistic because we have currently one member of parliament. We've got now two because of a by-election, but we've got, we did have at that time one member of parliament in the entirety of Scotland. And Scotland is uh, populated with quite a lot of MPs. I think it's about 56, 57 MPs. So predominantly it was really Scottish National Party domain, Nicola Sturgeon as first minister, completely dominant. But we did always know that we would need to win seats in Scotland because what we'd have to do in our swing in England would be so immense that the path, the path to victory, absolutely uh, had uh, was running through Scotland. What's happened since then is that we've done a big rebuild in Scotland. So Scottish Labour, I think, has got much stronger under the leadership of Anna Sawa, who was the leader that then came in once um, Keir came uh, came to, to power as um, Labour leader uh, for the UK party. They have really worked in concert together in rebuilding Scottish Labour. And we are seeing the signs of that pay, starting to pay off. And obviously, the uh, fall of Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP had also caught up in, I think, similarly, a kind of Hollywood-focused um, issue around kind of the SNP's finances and uh, some of the question marks on that but more fundamentally also like the Conservatives this kind of questioning of their electoral coalition overall where Labour were always trying to go for voters who had voted SNP who'd probably voted yes in the independence referendum or be saying yes now but might be inclined to vote Labour if they felt that Labour were representing a more a cohesive program that would speak to their kind of economic interests, their social interests, because the SNP is so focused on being united around having another independence vote and are now caught up in these issues to do with their own party, that it felt like their basis uh, of coming together was less clear than Labour's. And that was really exposed during the SNP leadership contest, where you had a very broad spectrum um, politically of candidates. Uh, so Labour is starting to poll much, much better in Scotland. Um, so we could see uh, Labour around the sort of the central belt, uh, so the sort of central part of Scotland, start to see an improvement we might see on the uh, island as well. So, so Labour is starting to really build up its base, not just in you know a red wall or towns and suburbs, but it's geographically now quite spread. Uh, which is exactly uh, what will be worrying the Tories and the SNP, because that's what you need to get a majority in the House of Commons. Well, my own focus groups that I conducted uh, when I was in Glasgow uh, late last year, I can tell you that some of my cousins who are, I guess they would be in that sort of, I won't say they're right, there's a boomer kind of uh, generation that had always voted Labour, voted yes in the referendum, started voting SNP, uh, are coming back to Labour and uh, had said to me that they're going to vote Labour the next um, UK election. Um, but my younger cousins who are in their 20s, I haven't got them yet, but I'm still working yeah. on them. Um, Claire Ainsley, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. As always, it's been a great conversation. I've, lots of questions I still had to ask you, but I'd, we needed to wrap up. But I think we might, if you'll indulge, we might get you back on the show as we get closer to um, the general election whenever um, the Prime Minister deems that he wants to call it. Thank you very much for your time today. Lovely. You're very welcome. Hey there. Thanks for listening to Social Democratic. Did you like the podcast? Hit the follow or subscribe button and be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. And to get all the latest updates on Socially Democratic, follow Dunn Street on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And we'll see you next Friday.